You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. Those campaigning for the yes vote in the Scottish referendum were keen to convey how out of touch those governing in Westminster were with the rest of Britain. Now Scotland has voted no and the fallout is being felt over questions of how fairly the UK is represented. All three main party leaders did in the end pledge to grant more powers to Scotland. Downing Street says more powers will be handed to Holyrood. However, the question has been raised over whether only English MPs should vote for English laws, known as the West Lothian question. Another consequence of the Scottish referendum is the argument for more powers to be spread across different regions of England. Just days before the Scottish ballots, the think tank Respublica said that the city of Manchester should be given income tax raising powers and complete control of spending within five years. They say it's a blueprint for full devolution to English cities. So, what kind of narrative has the Scottish referendum thrown up, not just north of the border, but across the UK? Where does it put arguments surrounding the West Lothian question and English Parliament and a federal UK? Well, to discuss this and the issues surrounding it, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by the author and broadcaster Richard Seymour. Also here is Amandeep Singh Bogal. He's a former British diplomat and conservative activist. And also here in the studio, Andrew Blick. He's a lecturer in politics at King's College London. And he's also author of the upcoming book, Beyond Magna Carta, A Constitution for the United Kingdom. A warm welcome to you all, gentlemen. And interesting, um, uh, in, in the days after the Scottish referendum, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Danny, Danny Alexander, he's criticised David Cameron for hinting that the West Lothian question, as well as handing more powers to Holyrood, Holyrood should be dealt with in tandem. Um, I mean, from your perspective, Andrew, do you think Holyrood can be given powers without the West Lothian question actually being addressed? I think that there are clearly going to be major knock-ons for the UK constitution as a whole from what's going on in Scotland. That was always clear. And it's a shame that a way wasn't found of, of addressing these issues in tandem in advance. Now, whether the West Lothian question is actually the whole issue is I, I would dispute. I think the West Lothian question is real. There is a problem with in unequal representation of, of England and those areas to which devolution has taken place. But actually, I think it's a bigger question than that. There are two aspects to it. One is what goes on at UK level, the relationship between the different components of the UK, between Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland and England, or whatever way we find of representing England. That's one level of this question. The other level of the question is decentralisation. How do we actually devolve, if we want to, more power within England? Because England is such a large unit that simply giving more power to England doesn't answer any questions about devolution, about downward transfer of power. So actually, my answer to your question is, it's going to be a bigger issue than that. It's a more difficult question than that. And answering both those different issues at the same time, answering either one of them is tricky enough. They relate to each other and answering them both is even more complicated. So actually, there's a much bigger issue even than that on the agenda. Indeed. And uh, I mean, Amandeep, do you think David Cameron panicked a bit um, ahead of a couple of very bad polls, which suggested that um, he may lose uh, the union may be lost, he may be the Prime Minister that presided over the loss of the UK um, and he he was a bit too hasty in promising more powers to Holyrood without the proper consultation perhaps with people even within his own party. No, no, I, th I don't think he panicked at all. I think uh, it was a very much a calculated uh, way of running the campaign as we saw in Quebec in Canada. Uh, it was during the latter parts of even that campaign that uh, uh, the campaign to keep it together uh, rang out its heavy-hitting uh, policies to make sure that people understood what was at stake. Uh, but that was a much closer campaign, wasn't it? I mean, that was very, very down to the wire. Well, that's what the poll suggested in this one, in the latter stages of it, I think. But yeah. uh, at the end of the day, I think with such an incredibly high turnout, uh, we, we, we saw that it was not a near the wire in this, as the poll had suggested. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think what is important to realise is that it set a, a trigger uh, for a much delayed debate on uh, what uh, was alluded to earlier about English votes for English laws, the West Lothian question. And it's not just about English votes for English laws, I think. It's about uh, giving a much balanced settlement for all the four nations of the United Kingdom, not just English votes for English laws, but also Welsh uh, and Northern Ireland as well. We'll, we'll touch on that in, in a minute, but just, just in terms of the aftermath of the Scottish referendum, I mean, Richard, how do you see, do you, do you see that's the end of the Scottish independence debate for a generation? Um, Alex Salmond is crying foul. He's saying that perhaps um, some of those promises made ahead of the, of the ballots 
are being reneged upon. They're not being they're not going to be met. I mean, what do you make of that? Yeah, well, I think he's correct about that. I mean, uh, as to the question of um, how, you know, the fallout, it's very clear that David Cameron panicked. Uh, the Financial Times has produced a detailed report of the campaign leading up to the uh, referendum result. And there was a very clear point at which the poll started to say yes would win. David Cameron uh, responded by getting on the phone to business leaders, uh, having a reception at Dining Street, serious arm twisting, very persuasive phone calls. And uh, the result was a big wave of business opposition to uh, independence. Um, and that really knocked the um, the wind out of the sails of the independence campaign. The aftermath of this, I think, is that while uh, they were able to save it at the last minute, uh, the momentum um, is very clearly towards, um, I think we're in a centrifugal state. Uh, the momentum is uh, towards uh, further separation. And um, I don't think that that um, can be stopped because if you look at the uh, the result in the votes, um, mm. it is overwhelmingly the older generation that voted no and overwhelmingly the younger generations that voted yes. Um, and you have to ask why that is. And I think if you look at it, uh, it is those generations that have had some experience of the post-war social compromise, um, the post-war compact of welfareism, social democracy and so on. Um, that's what they look to when they think about the United Kingdom and also um, Britain's role as a colonial power. Britain was once a multinational state at the heart of a global colonial system. No longer is. So it's falling apart for that respect. And younger generations see no purpose in it any longer. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the fallout from the Scottish referendum. With me in the studio, the writer and broadcaster Richard Seymour. Also here is Dr Andrew Blick, a lecturer in politics at King's College London, and Amandeep Singh Bogal, who is a former British diplomat and conservative activist. What do you make of that, Andrew? It's not the end of the debate. It's perhaps in 20 years' time um, a referendum would actually vote for independence, potentially. I think the independence issue, we cannot assume it's been put to bed permanently. You can't put a date on when exactly it will come back. It wasn't just David Cameron panicking. A lot of people were panicking. Nick Clegg was panicking. Gordon Brown was panicking. Ed Miliband was panicking. The Queen was probably panicking by the sound of it as well. And there was mass panic. And I think they had good reason to panic. And I think what could happen is that indirectly... Uh, David Cameron has written out some checks in the last phase of the uh, of the campaign which he can't necessarily cash because he needs the support of his MPs in Parliament. And if this is handled in the wrong way, it could very much bring Scottish nationalism back onto the agenda. We've got issues coming coming up which Alex Salmond has talked about. For instance, a possible referendum on continued membership of the European Union. If England is seen as somehow abusing its numerical and economic strength to drive through changes for the rest of the UK and to, to create a new constitutional arrangement where it's able, able to dominate in some ways even more than it was in the past. This issue is going to come back, I suspect. It, I, but I wouldn't say it's immediately on prospect another referendum, but I think to assume the issue is going to go away would be would be a big mistake. Uh, Amandeep, on, on the West Lothian question, the idea of Scottish votes on, on English laws, um, I guess the Conservatives would be keen to see this addressed because this would hurt Labour. They have 41 MPs north of, north of the border. Um, they would, if Labour were to form a government um, next year, perhaps unlikely after Ed Miliband's speech this week, but who knows, um, that, that, would, that would suit the Conservatives, wouldn't it? Well, look, I think uh, this debate is far, it, it ranges far more than just party politics. Uh, we've had uh, Labour leader Margaret Hodge uh, recently s saying that uh, Miliband uh, is kicking uh, the whole question of the West Lothian question into the long grass. So this is, this, this, this is a far bigger debate than just parties alone. Uh, I think this is a debate that uh, you have to, having listened to the voices of the of the Scots, I think it's about time that we listen to the voices of the millions of English, uh, the millions of the Welsh and, and uh, the millions of uh, the Northern Irish. It is far more than politics. And that is why I think uh, Labour has to grit its teeth and uh, understand that if they want to win, if they want to remain as a power in Westminster or even within the country itself, they have to listen and answer and respond. But wouldn't it be easy just to have the status quo and just perhaps have Scottish MPs exempt from votes? It doesn't happen all that often, does it? Well, look, I think autonomy is, uh, I've written about this recently, I think autonomy is something that we need to bring at uh, ever more lower levels of government, ever more lower levels of uh, how people 
select and re uh, elect their representatives. And we could actually end up uh, d reforming two things in once with this. I mean, I've suggested that we have our very own Vajra Sabha here, the House of the Counties, for example, where, we'd, where we would have legislative assemblies within counties, uh, then sending uh, elected members of the upper house in Westminster. So that's so that's a truly federal system, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. So you're look. That's the Indian example, if I've if I've that got that is, correct. That is, that, that is okay. Case. So what kind of uh, are you saying that India what was it? Twenty nine states, I think. Yes. They, 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 operate in unison harmoniously under this kind of system it's, it's a much well, well, it's a very disparate country well, well of, co of course it's not all all uh, harmony and uh, flowers and singing in 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 the fair fields of uh, Deccan of, of middle india of course not but it is a system that works it has worked it sprung together 565 princely states and it's binded them together in a union that i don't think really exists anywhere else maybe other than america is it inevitable, Richard, that we move to a federal system, a federal UK? It has been mooted. No, I don't think uh, any particular political settlement is inevitable. I think the uh, questions that are being posed that lead to this are inevitable. I mean, two things. First of all, um, when uh, Scottish people and Scottish voters talk about the Westminster elite, um, I think that resonates as much in England uh, mm. as anywhere else. I mean, the, I mean, I don't feel represented by the Westminster elite. Um, this is a, a populist question, if you like, versus, I mean, it's, popu it's, it's the people versus elites, generally speaking, uh, that's being represented here. In England, um, it tends to be UKIP that capitalises on this in a way that sort of suggests that uh, the Westminster elites have been captured by EU bu bureaucrats and pinkos and all the rest of it. Um, in Scotland, it just so happened that the democratic question was re reflected in the national question. So I don't think it's about uh, English votes for English uh, laws and so on and so forth. I really think it's about democracy. It's about how much control ordinary people in this country have over the political system. And uh, I feel that um, increasingly it's not very much. Um, how, how you sort of understand that and therefore what your solution is uh, will vary. But my view of this is that after 30 or 40 years of neoliberalism, essentially what we've had is that more and more areas of government have been outsourced, have been put in the control of uh, semi-private organisations, quangos and all the rest of it, or they've been transferred to part private you know, ownership and so on. Um, and essentially that removes it from the control of voters um, and increasingly turns it into an issue of consumerism. So that, um, and of course, you know, increasingly the parties tend to converge on a single model of governance, um, basically responding to Thatcher's slogan, there is no alternative. Well, if people feel that way, then of course, um, the, the, you know, what is the point of the elite in, res in a sort of representative sense? There's nothing that they can do that's any different from what previous governments have done. It was a catchphrase, wasn't it, Andrew, um, the Westminster elite? And I guess even if you weren't having a vote in the referendum, you were thinking, it made you think about just how well you were represented, but would um, moving towards, say, taking the West Lothian question to its conclusion, would moving towards an English parliament, wouldn't that not just create another level of bureaucracy and perhaps there's not particularly an appetite for that? This is an argument that's often advanced, particularly in, particularly in certain uh, sections of the media, that we can't possibly spend any money on this solution, that we've got to find an answer that doesn't cost any money. Therefore, English votes for English law is held up as being the best model for, partly for that reason. I think that's a terrible way round to approach any question. And if, if the Scottish people are allowed a parliament or the Welsh people are allowed a parliament, Northern Irish people are allowed a parliament, then the English people, if that's the system that's decided upon, the money should be a secondary issue. And of course, having an ineffective constitution that doesn't work properly can cost a lot of money anyway in the long run because you get terrible policy disasters when you've got an over-centralised uh, form of government, which but, we see over and over again in the UK. But wouldn't an English legislature challenge the authority of, of, of a UK parliament? I mean, it would, they wouldn't necessarily be working uh, in unison, would they? Yeah. On, on the authority issue, I think that there are very important reservations that need to be raised. English MPs for English laws, I think, can raise more difficulties than it solves because the only time it actually becomes relevant is when you've got a different party with a majority at UK level to has got a majority at England level, the only time it becomes relevant is the very point at which it becomes incredibly unstable and produces a crisis. That's a problem there. English Parliament, which I think is probably a better solution, does raise the exact problem you've been, you've been suggesting, that uh, you've got basically a Parliament representing 50 million people, so there's no real decentralisation, and an even bigger problem is it is so powerful that in some ways it's more powerful than the UK Parliament, than the UK government, and I think that will be a route 
on international experience towards disintegration. Federations that have a single unit within them that is so large as England would be. And an example is the Federation of the West Indies, where Jamaica was hugely dominant group within it and it fell apart in the early 1960s so I think it, it would be challenging for the UK to survive if it had a single English element within it. I mean what do you make of that Amandeep? Challenging? Look I think uh, democracy itself is challenging but it's it's the best way forward uh, whether it costs more money or whether it makes more challenges than perhaps it solves but I think what, what the people of uh, the UK across the UK I think are crying out for is maximum governance but with minimum government, whether it is Senate with its disenchantment, with the uh, as has been put, with people, some people in Westminster, or whether it's half, nearly half the people in Scotland who who voted to leave, I think people everywhere are crying out that they need a change in the way they govern, a change in the way they are taxed, and a change in the way how they elect the representatives. And as I said, I keep harking on about it, but I think. What we need is a much more decentralised, much more local, locally autonomous uh, system forward. So that wouldn't include an English parliament, but just a more federal system? No, I think an English parliament is uh, something that would have to be there. Otherwise, I don't think uh, such a, a House of the Counties would be relevant, because as long as you have a Scottish parliament, uh, we, 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 first class devolution to Scotland, second class devolution to, to Wales and Northern Ireland with their legislative assemblies, but nothing of a similar nature for England. I think without an English parliament, the House of Counties would not work, would not make sense. So you'd have a prime minister and an English first minister? Yes. What do you think of that? I mean, what's the prospect of that, Richard? That's problematic, I guess. No, no, I agree with Andrew. I think that uh, an English parliament would be too powerful. Um, I think uh, if you really want to, I mean, why are we assuming that national, uh, sorry, the nations are the appropriate units for parliaments um, to, 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 to exist here? Um, if we are assuming that, then let's just go the whole hog. Let Scotland have independence. You know, I mean, really, um, I think we could talk about having a Yorkshire Parliament. We could talk about having a London Parliament. Um, you know, you could talk about having a devolution along these lines. The real question, though, is underlying it. What's it for? OK, I mean, I think it's true that there is a, a you know, a crying need. People want to change um, uh, the way in which they're governed and have more control. I mean, this is the vital thing over the way in which they're governed. Um, it depends, you know, where, depending on where you are, people will answer the question differently. But if you ask the average Scottish person, it was um, defend the NHS. In England, they're privatising the NHS. In Scotland, we're not. Um, defend the welfare system. In England, they're cutting it. We don't want to cut the welfare system. You know, So um, local people will, will have different priorities. Um, and we should have, um, we should work out a democratic and uh, constitutional solution that allows these issues to be uh, adequately addressed, um, because obviously the current Westminster setup um, is so insulated from the population at large um, that it's incapable of doing so, and that is the basis for the po you know the potential breakup of the UK. I think. I mean, on the point of. of devolution, for instance, to cities. The last Labour government focused on the nine English administrative regions as vehicles for, for devolution. Um, but outside Greater London, no progress was really made. I mean, why do you think that was, Andrew? Is there an appetite for that? There is a problem with finding regions that people identify with. That's why the, the, uh, the English, uh, the, the idea of England as a political unit has some appeal, but for the reasons I, I said is problematic. Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, everyone understands what they are as, as, as areas. People are attached to them, certainly to uh, Wales and Scotland anyway. Whereas these regions that we use didn't quite have the resonance. So you had the East Midlands region, the South West region. Doesn't mean as much to people necessarily. So there, was, there were problems with actually finding a, a, a way of attaching people to those regions and really really feeling like they belonged. That's why I'm in many ways attracted to, to the model we've just heard heard of, of the counties because they do actually have have a region you know they actually have a have a resonance that people do understand that a county exists and the, the problem with cities is that you can't necessarily achieve coverage of the whole of England if that's what you're looking for and that not everyone lives in a city or wants to be told they live in a city region do people in Cornwall want to be told they live in the Plymouth city region? I doubt it. Uh, but but uh, there was a referendum on a North East Assembly and that was yeah. resound, that was yeah. rejected completely. That's, yeah. in your view, because uh, people don't really feel that they're from the North East. They might feel that they're from, I don't know, from Durham or from Newcastle, but not necessarily a, a whole con conglomerate called the North East. 
There were various problems with part, also including what was actually on offer in that referendum. It wasn't much in a way of serious powers being devolved. The way it was run wasn't particularly good. So there were lots of problems, but I would say one of those problem, problems was certainly the fact that people didn't necessarily have the level of attachment that was necessary and people in Middlesbrough didn't necessarily want to be the part of the same system as government as people in Sunderland or, and people in Newcastle similarly. Those barriers can be overcome. I'm not saying you can't create a region and let the identity follow afterwards, as we've seen with, say, the French departments, which were artificial creations. That can be overcome, but it's a challenge that's actually got to be faced. But people feel probably, if you're from Yorkshire, you feel more allegiance to being a Yorkshireman. And so I guess if you go county by county, you'll have quite a lot of institutions in the end. I mean, if, if, you're, if every county is represented in that kind of way, that would be quite unwieldy, I would have thought. England's a big place. We've heard how many states you can have in India. I think and the important thing is the Indian system works better, my guess is, with a larger number of, of states than if you had one state in India that made up 80% of the population of India. I think India would soon fall apart just in the way that I suspect the UK might well do if it had such a big unit in it. So the important thing is to find units that are small enough not to overwhelm the rest of the of the federal constitution but are big enough to be functional and not and not create too unwieldy a structure and that hopefully people actually feel attached to in some way that's quite a big challenge but i think that's the challenge that's probably facing us is that a challenge that the conservatives are committed to do you think the liberal democrats certainly are well i think the challenge that the conservatives are committed to is uh, addressing the concerns of uh, millions of people both within england wales and northern ireland uh, I think what we can learn, certainly from the Indian setup, is that uh, certainly the mistakes that were made in the Indian setup was uh, we recently had the creation of a state of Telangana in the south. Now, again, it's at the end of the day, it all boils down to local and autonomous identity. People of Andhra Pradesh, the this, this state which was Telangana was created from, uh, southern, the southern uh, lot of, of that state didn't feel as though they were uh, Andhra Pradesh at all. They, they felt they were Telangana more historically, and that is what they have got. So that is why I, I think uh, we can't have northeast region or southeast region. It d just does not work. It will, at the end of the day, fall apart because there's no allegiance, there's no identity. I mean, what is a southeastern person? You, you, we know what a Kent, Kentish man is, we, we know what a Surrey person is, we know what an Essex man is. What is a southeast person? So that is why I think uh, the county's way forward. It might cost a lot. Mm. It might create more bureaucracy, but at the end of the day, if we want to do democracy, then you must do it properly. Um, Respublica said that that's the think tank said that Manchester should be given income tax raising powers, complete control of spending within five years. I'm just wondering, I mean, Richard, this idea, do you think this could be a blueprint for full devolution to English cities at least? I think, uh, well, I'm, I'm, you know, in principle in favour of this. I mean, we've got to go back and look at what uh, happened. Uh, one of the things that happened under Mrs Thatcher, for example, was that local powers to raise taxes, raise rates and so on, were taken away. And part of this was about battling so-called loony left councils. It was actually just about battling social democracy. Um, and essentially, I think if you give cities the power to raise taxes, um, uh, you know, they will find ways to um, develop social housing. They'll find ways to meet the needs of their local population. So I think in principle, it's a good idea. I mean, it really depends. Uh, I mean, we have to be comprehensive about this. You can't just have it from Manchester and then not consider what's going to happen elsewhere because that's the basis for resentment and unevenness. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the fallout from the Scottish referendum. With me in the studio, the writer and broadcaster Richard Seymour. Also here is Dr Andrew Blick, a lecturer in politics at King's College London, and Amandeep Singh Bogal, who is a former British diplomat and conservative activist. I guess, uh, but it is a step towards moving away from a London-centric UK, and that's part, part of what the narrative has been following the Scottish referendum, hasn't it? Yes, yeah, so I think well, one of the one of the logics of a of a federal system, and I suspect we're moving in that direction. We may not go all the way there, but we've been moving in that general direction for some time, and will continue to do so. One of the logics of a federal system is you don't have any one city which controls everything. In Germany, Berlin may be the political centre, but it's not also the financial centre, the commercial centre, the media centre. It's not the centre for everything, and there will be a challenge. And I think rightly to the the hegemony of London if we move further towards a federal system. And would that, that be 
a good thing? Would that be a good thing if the hegemony of London was challenged in that way? I think in many ways it would be a good thing because it will disperse opportunities and a sense of belonging more widely within the UK. And let's not forget that amidst all this talk about devolution, about transferring power downwards, about dispersing, we're also talking about trying to create some kind of coherent attachment to the UK as a whole. That's why how we got to where we are now, because Scotland nearly left. So alongside uh, dispersing all this all this power, we've got to make sure that uh, we, we create some kind of sense of identity. And in that sense, a federal constitution has got to offer something for everybody. Everybody's got to feel like they belong to this constitution. And one way of doing that is actually dispersing some of the powers within London more widely. So you've got a constitution that people actually feel like they belong to. Belong to. And that also goes for finance. However much financial power we transfer downward, there's got to be also some kind of formula for redistribution of money, whether people like it or not. On the constitution question, Amandeep, should there be a written one? Uh, it's unusual that Britain doesn't have one. It's, there's not many countries that don't. Well, look, I think it is a unique uh, situation we are in as far as that is concerned. But I don't think whether we need to be going around rewriting uh, a constitution or writing one in the first place, as you might put it. Look, the system that we've had uh, is not perfect, but it has largely worked over the last few, uh, many hundred years. What we do need, of course, is to see how we apply that system going forward. Now, Westminster has its place. Uh, it has its place to drive the national narrative as far as the UK is concerned, to keep the, the, the unity and the union together. But as far as things such as local taxes or local uh, levies on trade are concerned, well, that should be decided by local people in local counties. Westminster should be looking to provide the narrative on how we deal with the rest of the world, how uh, in terms of the national narrative in politics of how we are governed. But local counties, are, and I go back to this, it is a system that has worked. It would set counties against counties in terms of competition, in terms of increasing their ability to create jobs by being more competitive, uh, in, 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 in uh, attracting businesses to, 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 to them rather than uh, Westminster telling them where to go and where not to go. I mean, on, Richard, what do you think about the idea of a, of, a, of a written constitution? And is it something that, say, the public can really engage with? Um, it might feel a bit too uh, vague for a lot of people to, to, to sell the idea to the public. I mean, what do you think? Depends who writes it. Um, I mean, this is the ultimate thing. Um, when the uh, Americans uh, wrote a constitution, it was following a revolution which involved, you know, very large numbers of people. And, of course, it was written by a very small elite. Um, but there was a sense in which it was coming out of a, a, a genuinely, um, well, in a sense, a democratic process, hardly a perfect one. Um, but um, I think if there was um, a, a serious mobilization behind this idea... Um, and if uh, masses were engaged in uh, supplying ideas, yeah, I mean, it, it could work. The thing about the Westminster elite, if I um, may use this phrase, is uh, when we talk about the hegemony of London, um, there is a very clear spatial distribution of power and wealth in this country. We talk about the North-South divide. Now, it's not perfect, but if you look at Danny Dorling's, um, one of his most recent books about the United Kingdom and mapping wealth and power in it, um, he's a very good geographer. Um, one of the points he makes is that uh, in austerity Britain, in the Britain of the coming decades, what you're going to see is the north moving a bit further south um, and the wealth and, and power imbalance becoming more and more um, extreme. And this is, you know, I mean, obviously, the, the, this in itself is a, a recipe for um, uh, further fragmentation, um, further alienation from the political uh, system. Um, and, you know, if, if there's not a productive way of addressing that, then probably just mass political apathy and detachment. So um, it seems to me that uh, a constitutional um, uh, question, if it's going to be posed in that way, um, has to be about addressing these injustices. I mean, if Scotland, uh, if the issue of Scottish nationalism and independence had just been about Scottish voters being hypnotised by the St Andrew's Cross, wanting to wave the salt tower, all that stuff, it wouldn't have got past 25%. It got to 45% because Alex Salmond very cannily said, look, this is about the NHS. This is about the welfare state. This is about the things that you treasure and love. This is about the things that make that make Britain a bit more fair. Um, and we're going to preserve these in Scotland, whereas the rest of the UK isn't. So, if we're going to answer, if we're going to set up a constitutional question, it has to be based on these. Otherwise, uh, you know, we're, it, nobody's going to be interested. I think. Uh, and would there be that mobilisation, perhaps throughout the population, for a written constitution uh, that we've been speaking about? 
At present, uh, if you look at the opinion polling evidence, when people are asked in generality about the idea of a written constitution and it's put to them in terms of a way of controlling populations and a, a way of controlling uh, politicians and a way of defining your rights, they say they like it. If you probe a bit more deeper, they don't regard it as a priority. Mm. It's not at the moment something that's going to mobilise people onto the streets, French-style barricades being set up. That's not going to happen at the moment. However, I think what we are seeing in the UK over, over a period of decades, and I think the point about being in a post-imperial era of constitutional crisis is absolutely true, that we've actually seen a breakdown in the old way of doing things, the old tacit assumptions whereby people who were in positions of power knew what broadly was expected of them and didn't need to ask and didn't need to tell what the rules were. That's actually been falling apart. And I think we've seen it. It really is crashing now. The assumptions underpinning the union, for instance, nobody really knows what they are any longer. So I think that does create a need. And that need could over time create a growing crisis, which could filter its way down to the population. But as was said, a way has got to be found of engaging them in issues that matter to them and they see matter to them Otherwise, they are going to turn off or continue to be turned off in the way that they are. And we know that engagement in traditional forms of political activism have been in, in, in decline for some, some years and probably aren't going to come back. So a new way of engaging the population has to be found. We don't quite know what it is yet, but we might need to find it. We don't know what it is yet, but the political landscape has changed since the referendum. Would you agree with that? No, I, I agree with that absolutely. I think uh, one of the things the referendum has, of course, triggered is a wider debate and a long, a delayed debate, I think, on need for change, on the need of how we govern ourselves. Uh, I mean, look, look, apathy amongst the population in terms of how they're governed and how their politicians relate to them, I think, has got a lot more to do uh, rather than with uh, politics itself, but how we as a country exist, how social welfare exists, for example. I think, in my opinion, if you compare us with the likes of India, with the likes of Nigeria, with the likes of China, where there is no welfare, people actually, I think, in this country believe as long as they have a social welfare net, whether they vote Conservative, whether they vote Labour, or whether they don't vote at all, nothing will change. They will not be able to make a change. They're happy with the status quo. I think that is one of the things that we need to address. Now, Alex Salmon may have uh, used that narrative of defending the NHS and defending social welfare in Scotland, but at the end of the day, it was not costed. He never actually gave reasonable answers how he would fund it. Social welfare, I think, is the key. Uh, social welfare reform, I think, is the key to addressing a lot of the apathy that exists for our politics and uh, why it needs to change. And, and away from apathy, just finally, Richard, I mean, I guess the, the, the high turnout of uh, the uh, referendum last week, do you think that impetus will be felt uh, between now and 2015? I mean, the, the narrative has changed, whether it's about a more devolved Britain, a Brit English parliament and so on. Um, uh, the way people engage with politics has changed, hasn't it, since the referendum? Well, in Scotland it has. Um, nowhere else, but... Um, nowhere I've, else? Not, not in England? No, no way. Um, I mean, you know, we're, we're all watching from afar, but um, I don't think that it's made any uh, significant alteration yet. Um, in Scotland, I think what's happened is that there's been a mobilisation of con constituencies that have traditionally not taken part in politics. You know, the kinds of people that Andrew was talking about uh, who've uh, turned off. Um, they turned on. Um, they got involved, they turned out. Um, and that's why there was a risk uh, at the last moment of a possible yes vote. Um, I hesitate to say risk because it's something I would have welcomed. But, um, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, how this is going to play out in the future, I think it's very clear that um, the, the demand for, um, you know, social protections, for welfare and so on, um, is coming, it's not something that's, you know, coming from above, it's coming from below. Um, and it's coming from um, the traditionally underrepresented council states in Glasgow and Dundee and elsewhere. Um, and that is why they mobilised to defend that system. Now, we talk about how it's costed. Traditionally, um, Scotland has uh, been kind of lied to and kind of deprived of information about how much wealth is available in the UK continental shelf. Um, in North Sea oil. I mean, it's tremendously profitable. If you look at UK profit rates, most of it is coming from the UK continental shelf. But um, there was a lot of information withheld by Westminster about this. Um, in reality, I think an independent Scotland would have been uh, in surplus 
and a lot better off than England uh, in, economically and therefore would have been able to sustain uh, a, a more wealthy uh, or more generous welfare state. But ultimately, you know, this stuff comes down to something else. It's not just about costing. It's not just about how much money you've got in the, the till, you know, all the rest of it. It's actually what's happened over the last 20, 30, 40 years, um, which is about a sustained and generational length redistribution of wealth and power in favour of the rich and in favour of those who already have power. Um, and somehow reversing that, um, that's a political process that requires, um, you know, a, a long term engagement. Um, it's not something you can just do by having a balanced budget. Indeed. Well, look, that's all we've got time for. That's Richard Seymour, Richard, Richard Seymour, the writer and broadcaster, also here in the studio, Amandeep Singh Bogal, uh, former British diplomat and conservative activist, uh, and Andrew Blick, lecturer in politics at King's College London, also author of the upcoming book, Beyond Magna Carta, a constitution for the United Kingdom. Many thanks for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia in London. <laughs> But that was a much closer campaign, wasn't it? I mean, that was very, very down to the wire. Well, that's what the poll suggested in this one, in the latter stages of it, I think. But mm. uh, all, all, at the end of the day, I think with such an incredibly high turnout, uh, we, we, we saw that it was not a near the wire in this, as the poll had suggested. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think what is important to realise is that it set a, a trigger uh, for a much delayed debate on uh, what... Uh, was alluded to earlier, about English votes for English laws, the West Lothian question. And it's not just about English votes for English laws, I think. It's about uh, giving a much balanced settlement for all the four nations of the United Kingdom, not just English votes for English laws, but also Welsh uh, and Northern Ireland as well. We'll, we'll touch on that in, in a minute, but just, just in terms of the aftermath of the Scottish referendum, I mean, Richard, how do you see, do you, do you see that's the end of the Scottish independence debate for a generation. Um, Alex Salmond is crying foul. He's saying that perhaps um, some of those promises made ahead of the of the ballots are being reneged upon. They're not being. They're not going to be met. I mean, what do you make of that? Yeah, well, I think he's correct about that. I mean, uh, as to the question of um, how you know the fallout, it's very clear that David Cameron panicked. Uh, the Financial Times has produced a detailed report of the campaign leading up to the uh, referendum result and. There was a very clear point at which the poll started to say yes would win. David Cameron uh, responded by getting on the phone to business leaders, uh, having a reception at Dining Street, serious arm twisting, very persuasive phone calls. And uh, the result was a big wave of business opposition to uh, independence. Um, and that really knocked the, um, the wind out of the sails of the independence campaign. The aftermath of this, I think, is that while uh, they were able to save it at the last minute, uh, the momentum... Um, is very clearly towards, um, I think we're in a centrifugal state. Uh, the momentum is uh, towards uh, further separation. And um, I don't think that that um, can be stopped because if you look at the uh, the result in the votes, um, mm. it is overwhelmingly the older generation that voted no and overwhelmingly the younger generations that voted yes. Um, and you have to ask why that is. And I think if you look at it, uh, it is those generations that have had some experience of the post-war social compromise, um, the post-war compact of welfareism, social democracy and so on. Um, that's what they look to when they think about the United Kingdom and also um, Britain's role as a colonial power. Britain was once a multinational state at the heart of a global colonial system. No longer is. So the other level of the question is decentralisation. How do we actually devolve, if we want to, more power within England? Because England is such a large unit that simply giving more power to England doesn't answer any questions about devolution, about downward transfer of power. So actually, my answer to your question is, it's going to be a bigger issue than that. It's a more difficult question than that. And answering both those different issues at the same time, answering either one of them is tricky enough. They relate to each other, and answering them both is even more complicated. So actually, there's a much bigger issue even than that on the agenda. Indeed. And uh, I mean, Amandeep, do you think David Cameron panicked a bit um, ahead of a couple of very bad polls, which suggested that um, he may lose uh, the union 
may be lost. He may be the prime minister that presided over the loss of the UK. Um, and he, he was a bit too hasty in promising more powers to Holyrood without the proper consultation, perhaps, with people even within his own party. No, no, I, th- I don't think he panicked at all. I think uh, it was a very much a calculated uh, way of running the campaign, as we saw in Quebec in Canada. Uh, it was during the latter parts of even that campaign that uh, uh, the campaign to keep it together uh, rang out its heavy-hitting uh, policies to make sure that people understood what was at stake. Conservative activist and also here in the studio, Andrew Blick. He's a lecturer in politics at King's College London and he's also author of the upcoming book Beyond Magna Carta, A Constitution for the United Kingdom. Well, welcome to you all gentlemen and interesting um, uh, in, in the days after the Scottish referendum. The Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Daniel, Daniel Alexander, he's criticised David Cameron for hinting that the West Lothian question as well as handing more powers to Holyrood, Holyrood should be dealt with in tandem. Um, I mean, from your perspective, Andrew, do you think Holyrood can be given powers without the West Lothian question actually being addressed? I think that there are clearly going to be major knock-ons for the UK constitution as a whole from what's going on in Scotland. That was always clear. And it's a shame that a way wasn't found of, of addressing these issues in tandem in advance. Now, whether the West Lothian question is actually the whole issue is I, I would dispute. I think the West Lothian question is real. There is a problem with in unequal representation of, of England and those areas to which devolution has taken place. But actually, I think it's a bigger question than that. There are two aspects to it. One is what goes on at UK level, the relationship between the different components of the UK, between Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland and England, or whatever way we find of representing England. That's one level of this question. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. Those campaigning for the yes vote in the Scottish referendum were keen to convey how out of touch those governing in Westminster were with the rest of Britain. Now Scotland has voted no and the fallout is being felt over questions of how fairly the UK is represented. All three main party leaders did in the end pledge to grant more powers to Scotland. Downing Street says more powers will be handed to Holyrood. However, the question has been raised over whether only English MPs should vote for English laws, known as the West Lothian question. Another consequence of the Scottish referendum is the argument for more powers to be spread across different regions of England. Just days before the Scottish ballots, the think tank Respublica said that the city of Manchester should be given income tax raising powers and complete control of spending within five years. They say it's a blueprint for full devolution to English cities. So, what kind of narrative has the Scottish referendum thrown up, not just north of the border, but across the UK? Where does it put arguments surrounding the West Lothian question and English Parliament and a federal UK? Well, to discuss this and the issues surrounding it, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by the author and broadcaster Richard Seymour. Also here is Amandeep Singh Bogal. He's a former British diplomat and conservative.